Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is uh, David Early. I work at Red Hat. I've been the kernel maintainer for a long time <coughs> of graphics, and um, I recently started becoming more involved in compute and that side of the world. Um, so my talk today is pretty much a what's the status of GPU compute? Everyone like knows about, about CUDA, but we're, we're open source people. Uh, I, I, my looking at CUDA is like, okay, I'm not touching that because it's not open source. I don't care what it, how great or brilliant it is, but where, where's the alternate? Why haven't we got an open source thing for this already? Everyone loves CUDA, but not loads, but everyone has no choice but to love CUDA. Why have we not managed to do this? What's, what's going wrong? You know, so I'm just gonna give you a quick sort of introduction over use cases of what, 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 what computes for, what APIs are out there, what sort of components are in a GPU compute stack, what stacks are supporting these, and how are they developed and packaged, and possible futures. Uh, this is a very hand-wavy, vague possible futures talk. I have, have to say up front, I have not really done anything on this. Red Hat's not, this is not a Red Hat committed strategy. This is not a Red Hat, you know, this is just me throwing ideas out there and <coughs> trying to see if anything will stick and seeing if there's any sort of, I suppose, trying to find some upstream people to, you know, try and move this stuff along and figure out a better way of doing it rather than just saying, well, Red Hat's gonna solve this or, you know. So um, just the basic sort of use cases that people come up with compute for our sort of AI ML area. So machine learning's pretty big, AI's pretty big. TensorFlow seems to be the common thing that everyone sort of uses. That's then based on a stack of other stuff. So you go, oh, I'll just build TensorFlow. And then three days later, you've managed to figure out, oh, it's built Eigen, it's built, uses Blast, it's using, with NVIDIA, you got like the CU DNN libraries. There's just a lot of stuff that you need to do to get this system in place. Um, HPC is another big area. HPC is a lot more custom application, so built on the stack, but you don't have these sort of you still use the common libraries, like Blast and stuff will be used, like the linear algebra stuff, and, but there's not as much of a common application as TensorFlow. TensorFlow is quite a, you know, it, it's a focal point. Um, and then scientific applications, again, using similar sort of stuff. But it's, yeah, there's a good few use cases. There's a lot of stuff out there. People want to do this stuff, and they want to do it on GPUs because GPUs do it so much faster than CPUs. Um, so first up, APIs. So CUDA is, the, the leader, it's, the, it's NVIDIA defined. There's, not, there's no specification process as far as I know. It's NVIDIA come out with a new API. This is what you get. It's unfortunately closed source. Um, it's, the way you use CUDA is pretty much called a C++ based. There's other options, but C++ based, but it's single source. And this is a big differentiator between how you write using these APIs. It's, you have a choice of single source or, well, I suppose non-single source, but single source pretty much, be, Ryan, you write code in C++ and you sort of describe a chunk of that code and that, some of that code will end up running on your GPU. Whereas non-single source is you write a, a chunk of code for the host and you write an obvious chunk of code to run on the GPU and that's, they're compiled separately and they're all just, there's a you know, set of calls. But the, the, co the, co I suppose the control flow of single source is a lot more obvious. It's a lot more the programming model people want. People don't really want the other model, but there is cases where it's, it's used. But, so it just, but CUDA is pretty much based around C++-based single source. There's a lot of support libraries that come with CUDA. They've got their own last. They've got CUDNN, which is a pretty important part of TensorFlow. Um, but that, that's the, the industry standard API at the moment. As I say, people love it, but some don't. <laughs> um, but what else is ha sort of happening out there? There's HIP, which is the AMD, I can't believe it's not CUDA, uh, heterogeneous compute interface reportability, the name just pretty much rolls off the tongue. Um, it's got, it has its source code released on GitHub. Um, I'll get into this a bit later. Um, yeah, it's under, it's under a, an open source compatible license, it's, it's fine. Uh, it's also C++ based, single source. Um, again, it has some support libraries, HIP plus, HIP DNN. It pretty much is a, sort of a good attempt, you know, to try to recreate the CUDA style. Um, we have OpenCL. So OpenCL is the old reliable, came from Apple via Kronos. It's a Kronos standard. Uh, there's open 
implementation, there's closed implementations, there's the, the OpenCL standard sort of 1.2 seems to be what everyone implemented, and then 2.0 was a bit more pie in the sky, futuristic, and we didn't have implementations for it, and they're slowly catching up, but again, certain vendors don't want to do a CL 2.0 implementation or have no motivation to do it because they have CUDA. Why would you care about doing this? So, also, somebody then added C++ to OpenCL. So OpenCL, apart from being just like a standard for running things, it has its own sort of C and C++ implementations that you write code for like in separate source files. So it's not single source. You don't get the nice control flow. It's, it's kind of messy. Um, it also offers online and offline compilation. So you can take that GPU code that you've built, build it and have it built at when you're executing. So not when you're, you know, before you do it offline, you just build while you're actually running your app. But that means you then have to have a full C or C++ compiler inside your OpenCL stack, which gets kind of messy. It's, you know, it, it, it has some issues in the, how it, the design, but they're trying to get improve that. And one of the ways they're trying to improve that is Spear V, which is this uh, intermediate representation I'll get to later. And they can accept these kernels. So they don't just have this. You can have the source or the binary. You can have this other representation and use that then to build your final binary. But it's a lot lower level. You don't need to be having your full C and C++ compiler sitting in your stack. Another sort of standard that's been, it's just started up. It's, it's been around for a little while, but it's not gotten a huge amount of traction yet. But it's a, another Chrono standard called Cycle. Um, Cycle attempts to bring the sort of single source solution to OpenCL in a nicer fashion. Um, you, again, you have your single source code. It can run on your CPU or it can run on your GPU. If you want to run it, the implementation then can decide to use, say, OpenMP to execute this code on your CPU, or it can use OpenCL to launch the same code on your GPU. So it's, it's sort of a layer above OpenCL. It doesn't actually require OpenCL. You could make a cycle implementation on top of something else. So it has that flexibility. But at the moment, nearly all cycle implementations are using OpenCL for launching on the device. There's a closed source implementation of cycle from Codeplay. Pretty much Codeplay is a compiler company, and they pretty much drive this standard at the moment. They, you know, they're doing a lot of the work. There is an open source implementation on GitHub called Tricycle, uh, which Xilinx, a guy, a guy who used to work for AMD and now works for Xilinx, started. Uh, it was sort of being used as an experimental ground. It was like, oh, we want to try something new. This is an easy, easy way to do it with this open source implementation. Um, I've been picking up on it for the last few months and just hammering it. With, they have a conformance suite internally at Kronos, and I've been just ha trying to hammer. I'm sort of combining my ability to learn C++ and implement this standard at the same time, which seemed like a good way to learn. Because it, it relies on C++ 17, it relies on you know, a lot of templating, and I'm starting to find out all these interesting terminology. But Stack Overflow is really good for learning C++. <laughs> but these they seem to be, so Cycle is kind of a, the idea at least is we have a standardized version of that sort of, we can do what CUDA can do. We can do a single source implementation for all of these applications. Um, there are other APIs out there that I haven't dug too far into because it's endless. So there's C++ AMP from Microsoft, which, yes, sorry to say, yeah, compute is Linux. There is no compute on Windows. Really, that battle's not worth even thinking about. Um, you know, Windows compute's not a feature of the marketplace. No one wants to deploy a workload on Windows. It's not out there. So that's, that's a dead end as far as I'm concerned. Um, OpenMP, there's a lot of, we could make OpenMP better. Maybe we can do more GPU stuff with OpenMP again. There's a lot of hand waving in that area about how possible to make the API better, but it's it's a difficult thing. It's like you get a lot. Oh, we could describe the data sets and a set of rules, and we can make these really interesting, and let the compiler figure it out. Um, and ever somebody ever says to me, "We'll let the compiler figure it out," I get bad, bad flashbacks to Titanium and some of the old very long instruction work GPUs, where nobody ever figured out how to make the compiler work it out because. Sometimes the compiler, you, can, you, you, know, you can't just punt things and say, magic compiler, you figure it all out, because magic compiler never shows up. Uh, you're, you're waiting for years. Uh, OpenACC is another standard in the same area. Again, I haven't done too much into it. It's been used, but uh, it, it doesn't really interest me in terms of what we can do here. 
One thing that's kind of interesting is Vulkan, the new low-level graphics API, has a compute interface. Um, and what's great about it is it's low level. It, you, your, your submission API is not got a whole lot of extra features you don't need. It's just pretty much take this kernel code and give it to the, to the graphics card. Um, currently, the Vulkan can't support the feature set of OpenCL. That's where it's, it's missing. It's, there's some work in trying to make Vulkan compute add more features. And, but the Vulkan standardization guys are very strict on what they will accept. They're very, you must have two implementations, you must have a full test, set of tests for a test suite. We will not give you, you will not put the extensions in without this work. And this is good because OpenCL should have done that because that's one of the mistakes I feel OpenCL made was they were like, oh yeah, we'll put that in the standard and it'll magically appear in the future. Whereas it should have been, we've got two implementations, we know how it works, it's here now we'll put it in the standard. So it, I feel Vulkan is doing the right thing there and that's saying, no, we're not just going to throw the kitchen sink in here because you asked for it. We want to wait around and see, see it's actually useful for people in the real world. So it, it may actually develop that they're currently focused on graphics, but there is a bit of push to try and add compute features. So we may get that end up, ending up being the end goal. Um, at a more high level, there's a lot of future API work in C++ standardization. Uh, the C++ standards body, it's, Everyone says they're contributing to the standards body, so I can't tell who's actually winning. You know, it's like the cycle guys are like, well, we're interested in, we're contributing our stuff to the standards body, and CUDA people are talking to the standards body, and OpenACC, and OpenMP, and everyone's talking to the standards body. And my feeling with the standards body is, whoever you talk to says their implementation is going to be the one that gets accepted, but nobody actually knows yet. And it's future, it's going to be C++ 20 or something at this point when we have these sort of things. Um, one of the things I've been told about the C++ standards, at least they want tested implementation. So the cycle guys were like, well, we've got this cycle standard we should be able to get. And it's like, well, we need to implement it. <laughs> you can't just say it's going to work. We need to be able to see that what you've done is working. And even if you have a high level C++ standard, you still need some sort of execution environment underneath it to run it. It's not like just because it's in C++ that your problem is solved. The compiler has to have some sort of run times and all that. So I'll just give a sort of quick overview of what a stack, a, a compute stack looks like. So there's two sort of parts to how, at least with a non-open CL stack. So with a, C, with a single source stack, there's two kind of parts. The first is building your application. So you take your source code at the top, which is your C++ sort of stuff. It then has to go into the compiler front end. The compiler front end has to then separate what's host code and what's device code. And then it has to decide, build code on the host compiler and build code with the device compiler. They then have to spit out, as normal, host compiler will spit out native object code, but the device compiler will spit out something magical in that it's not like x86 code, but it's not, it could be GPU assembly, or sorry, GPU binary, it could be uh, intermediate representation, it could be multiple of these. You can actually, you know, it could go, okay, I'm gonna give you a generic thing and then I'm gonna give you four specific things. And then that all gets stuck together into your ELF file, just like normal, and then the ELF file is your application executable, or library, or whatever. And then, so here's a picture of that, it's got the CPU object code and the GPU IR code stuck all in one, as it executes, You'll, you know, the CPU will go, oh, I need to call this function. Oh, it's in the GPU thing. I'll launch that kernel using some sort of launch platform. And that's the execution environment. So you need an execution environment. You want to run your application. It needs to sit on top of a few layers. There's some support libraries. There's a runtime that that's what's like, I want to actually execute this code on the GPU. Please make it happen. And so when the CPU code, when it reaches a function that it knows needs to be run on the GPU, will trampoline itself sort of and sort of kick into OpenCL or kick into the CUDA runtime and say, hey, launch this bunch of kernel code and get back to me when you're finished with executing it on all this data. Um, so the support libraries, there's a bunch of things in there depending on your application user spaces, runtime libraries. And then at the bottom, there's some sort of graphics kernel driver sitting over on top of the hardware. Uh, again, but yeah, so that's, that, that's pretty much a generic stack look. It's not, I'm hand-waving a few things, but it's, Pretty much they all end up looking something like that. OpenCL is a bit different because OpenCL also allows you to, ex to build that execution time. So when you have OpenCL, you have to have a full OpenCL front-end compiler. 
And then you have to have an intermediate compiler, because you can also accept other things that aren't in C and C++. So you have the Spear V stuff, and I'll, again, I'll get into that in a second. And then you've got your GPU coming on your hardware. So yeah, so it's slightly different. But again, most of the components are in a similar sort of area. You know, it's not a huge difference. So I'll just have a quick word on what IRs are, because IRs are very important when you talk about this stuff. So IRs are intermediate representations. They're a big compiler thing in that area. And they're pretty much, you take your C or C++, you parse it all, and then you don't want to go straight to binary. You need something that represents it in between the fully source code state and the fully binary state. That's called an intermediate representation. The common intermediate representation, there's also two types of intermediate representations. There's a type of intermediate representation you want to give to another part of the stack to use. Um, and they're usually more sort of formalized and try to be standardized. And then there's a type of intermediate representation that the compiler system will use internally. And those are usually a lot more changeable, mutable. You just, you, you need to add things to them quickly. Um, so in terms of intermediate representations that you want to give to other people, you've got the CUDA one is NVIDIA PTX. So they've got their low level PTX sort of, it's like an assembly level IR. Um, the AMD stack currently doesn't really have an IR at that level. It gives, ends up giving the binary to the other person of the GCM, which is unfortunate. It's, not a, it's a, bit, a bit frustrating. But that's, yeah, that's what they've decided they want to do. Um, Kronos, Spear V as well. Spear V is an intermediate representation defined by Kronos for OpenCL and Vulkan. But when you say the words Spear V, you should always qualify it with kernel or shader because okay, they look the same and they use the same building blocks, but how they are actually, like what the code can do is completely different depending on what execution environment you want to run it in. So you have to target your Spear V at either an OpenCL or a Vulkan implementation. So you, it, it is two different IRs hiding in the one like standardized format. Um, and then also internally in, sort of in your compiler stacks, you've got intermediate representations. And the two that sort of matter for the purposes of this talk is Mesa, which is the you know, Linux Open, OpenGL and Vulkan stack, has a thing called Near. And it, it, it's, it's what, what it uses for most of its G, GPU code. And then LLVM has the LLVM IR, which is a purely internal thing to LLVM. Um, People have tried to standardize that. There was an effort by Kronos thing called Spear, which was a precursor to Spear V, and that just sort of took LLVM IR, and then someone went, this thing's really unstable. We can't just go <laughs> making the standards, just copy what they do. So that's, that's actually why Spear V came about and became a lot, you know, it's a, it's a lot more thought about. They've actually sort of think, well, we have to keep this thing stable. Um, and just a quick, but OpenCL stacks, there's lots of them out there. They're very vendor specific. AMD has one, has two, I think. I think everyone's got two. Some of the people have, may have three. There's NVIDIA's OpenCL. People have already heard Intel have a Neo OpenCL stack that's come out recently. These are all, some of them are open source, some of them are closed source, but a lot of them have forked LLVM, forked CLANGs. They've got pieces of code. You know, they're not upstreaming those sort of things. They're just like big chunks of new CLANG code that's come out of nowhere. They're, 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 they're difficult to work with. Like, to deploy those sort of things, you have to pick which one you want to deploy, and you have to spend your time making that being the one thing on your system. But I just wanted to give a list at, at this point, because I'll, I'll, you'll see why in a minute. So what do the vendor stack sort of look like? So from CUDA's point of view, it, the same picture I had earlier, but just filled in with more of a CUDA-specific <laughs> tangent to it, is that, yeah, so you got your C++ CUDA at the application source, so you got your CUDA compiler front end. I'm sure John will tell me this is perfectly not right, but it's a hand wavy graph picture. Um, it splits, it, has got, it does host compilation into native object code. It does device compilation. It spits out PTX. It may also spit out other things alongside that, but at the base level, it will spit out this IR, and it will put that into the object file. So your object file will end up having PTX code and object code. And then in the execution environment, your application will run the CUDA runtime will take the PTX code and create the low-level uh, assembly code or binary code. So it will, it will actually end up being a compiler as well. So there's a compiler in there that compiles the PTX down to the binary that runs on your GPU. 
Again, different GPUs. The ISAs for GPUs are not like x86. They haven't been sort of stuck in one place. They move quite regularly. Every new generation of GPU will either add a few instructions, take some away, modify how they look. So they're not, they're not stable at that level. So they, that's why they end up needing this sort of finalizer thing that will take the PTX and make it into the IR, or sorry, into the binary, and that will execute it. Um, so that, that, that's the, the pretty much the basics of just the CUDA stack in terms of where its IR is used, and that's where PTX comes in. Um, so AMD's vendor stack is called Rockham. I can't remember what Rock stands for, actually. Uh, it probably rolls off the tongue like heterogeneous something else. Uh, so they actually have taken this thing, so they, they will let you use CUDA, and then they will, I suppose, said slash Perl slash something, all the file off the CUDA slash hip, and they will translate the CUDA API into HIP API, and they'll translate CUDA source code into HIP source code, and then they will, you then have an application that's C++ HIP, and then you run that through their HIP front end, and the same thing, their device compiler, and then they've got the assembly, but they don't have an intermediate representation, they actually put targeted binary code into the alpha object file. Um, which, yeah, it's like, okay, I don't want to ever change my GPU, I'm good here, but if you want to change your GPU, you, you are not good. Um, so yeah, the execution environment is, again, slightly similar. Language runtime, Rockham runtime, they don't really have to finalize as much. There may be an option for certain cases, but generally they've got the binary, they don't do finalization at all. There's just, yeah, throw that binary into the hardware and run it. So yeah, they've, they, they've made this bit simpler at the expense of making this bit more complex and having the ELF file being a lot more targeted. Um, they're the sort of two competing single source stacks and execution environments. Again, back to the vendor. So Intel has a Neo stack. This is an OpenCL stack that they've recently released, open source. It doesn't do CUDA or HIP level things. It's pretty much just a C++, OpenCL C and C++, and I think it can execute Spear VIR as well. So it's not on the same playing field as the other two stacks, but it's a building block to, you know, to get you towards that. Um, there's also an open stack for OpenCL. So Mesa has implementation of OpenCL called Clover. Uh, it's, it, it hasn't received the, the dedication that is required for it to be you know, what we need it to be. So far it's got OpenCL 1.1. OpenCL 1.2 is getting there. I think only, there's only one feature missing. It's like printf or something. And printf makes, when you think about it, printf's actually kind of messy when you want to run it on your GPU. Um, it's based on the Gallium architecture, which is an internal Mesa architecture that we use for running up. The graphics drivers are all, are you, nearly all the graphics drivers are written on top of this architecture at this stage. Um, Spear V support is currently being finalized. Uh, it works. Uh, and the back ends, like what, what ex it can execute on AMD, NVIDIA, uh, Freedreno, ARM. Again, this brings in a whole world of ARM devices as well. This opens up a possibility that we can execute this stuff on you know, non-X86 platforms as well a lot better. Um, there is a chance of this running with an Intel Gallium driver as well, so that possibility exists in the future as well. So that's kind of sort of what the state of play is currently in terms of what stacks are out there. I just want to get a bit more this bit about development model. So when somebody tells you, oh, it's fine, my stack is open source, what does it mean to them and what does it, should it mean to you? Is People in this area have been saying, oh, we've open sourced our stack. And what they mean is they've taken that as a release model, not as a development model. And in my, general, in my opinion, from the stuff I want to work on, I want open source development model. I want to be able to have the project I'm working on, in, be able to interact with that project at the same level as somebody working at a vendor or you know, in the company. You can't just release it by throwing it over the wall every three months and saying it's open source. It's like Android has done that in a lot of ways, but it's some areas it's, it's moving towards being better. But as, as someone that's not aligned with the vendors, you don't want to be on, you know, you don't want to be outside of the project and trying to push things in and then you know, relying on you know, processes you can't see and internal meetings and all this stuff that they've built up. It, the, the current model that the, the OpenCL, Intel's OpenCL and the Rockham are done on is vendor controlled. The vendor 
does all the development in-house, does all the design in-house, and kicks it out over the wall every three months and says, hey, it's open source. You guys just, you know, that's what you want, isn't it? And it's like, oh, okay, you missed, you know, you missed the memo on how this works. But it, uh, it comes down to then how do I a, support something like that? How do I put this into a distribution and move forward with it and support it? Because if it's buggy, how do I get fixes in? How do I make sure I'm not when I rebase this every six months when they kick it over the wall that it's not broken or it hasn't regressed in a horrible way that they don't care about but that affects the, the applications I'm running? Um, so I, I, it may have been there was some messaging in this because you know, you know, they, they've probably just heard, oh, well, once we open source stuff, all the Linux distributions will just magically take it because that's all they cared about. But it was like, no, open sourcing it was like the zero step. That was the, I can now talk to you once you've open sourced it. It's not the, oh, you've open sourced it, now it's in my distribution two weeks later. It's like they, there's a big disconnect between what they think open sourcing it is and what we think open sourcing something is. And it, it, for me, that's a, that's a problem because like, we have the Linux kernel. We already have a model of open source development and how to build things and how to get vendors to put stuff into a common area. And we have, in the graphics space, we have the Mesa project. And again, the Mesa project has a model of vendors cooperating and vendor, there's no vendor control in it. There's nobody, you know, I own this, I can drive it. It's like everyone has to cooperate and it works pretty well. Um, so why do I, why would I want to go back to having these vendor control stacks that don't let me contribute and don't let me, like how could I port AMD's Rockham to Intel? How can I port Intel's stack to AMD? And how do I get them running on NVIDIA? You know, there's a lot of challenges in this area for a, someone at the, other, at the end, someone that's like distributing this code. It's like they're very large bodies of code. Like these things take a lot of time to get into. The common code is not massive. There's, everyone loves to fork LLVM and CLang and like, uh, LLVM and CLang don't have the greatest, their development model is challenging, but the forking of them is impossible for a distributor to, to keep up with. Because, right, even from like a Fedora point of view at Red Hat, I, I, for, I think I packaged LLVM and CLang for about three years. And doing that was enough to make me not want to do it. I can't imagine someone going, well, I've got a fork of LLVM and I've got another fork. Could you package all three of these forks or four forks? Like you, you'd go insane. So you need to have at least baseline, all of this stuff needs to be upstreamed in LLVM. So if you're going and doing crazy stuff, you need to make sure that you figured it out upstream before you come back and say, here's my cool stack I've developed. So it, there's, there's challenges in this area and with the current stack. So. Kind of like the question is, A, is there anything we can do about this? Or should we? I, I, I just get the feeling that well, we have, as I said, we have Linux. We know how to do it. It's vendor-led at the moment. We also have the Linux experience of dealing with vendors, which is uh, generally it never ends well. Or it, it takes a long time to get vendors around to the way of doing things. You know, it involves pushing the right people into the vendor and getting them to align their goals, not with their own internal view of the world, but with an external sort of more holistic Linux view of the world. And, you know, they, they still have a lot of, because a lot of this stuff comes from a graphics point of view, and graphics from a Linux point of view is not really, a, wasn't really a primary focus. We were very, you know, enterprise doesn't need graphics, so why do we care about it? Like, you know, it's desktop, it's like stuff like that. All of a sudden it's like, oh, enterprise needs graphics. Oh, but how do we do this? And it's like, well, we should have started five years ago when we had graphics and we didn't have this problem, but, you know, we've done it now. So this is where I get a bit hand wavy. This is kind of like, well, what would I do if I had either time, resources, or cared enough, sort of, and I'm, I'm, maybe I will start caring enough. I'm, I'm getting there. Um, but it's sort of like a proposed stack for this sort of thing. So the first thing I believe is I would at least need a baseline reference implementation, something that we can ship in a distro that developers can pick up and just use and play around with, and it's just there. It mightn't be as super optimized for every case, but it's there and it's open source. It's in front of them. It's not defined by the vendor, it's neutral. Like the vendor, the, the, the contribution model will, would be a common set of code bases because you don't want to be held to this single vendor problem. You want to share as much of the code as possible because support costs go down if you support share as much of the code as possible. The, 
like from a point of view of, oh, I fixed a bug in this, oh, and it's got the same bug over here, and it's got the same bug over here, and he's just copied the code and all that, and it's like, it doesn't scale out. You need to minimize the vendor-specific code as much as possible, same as we do in the kernel. You know, we, we try to, we don't, we don't invite everyone to put their own 802.11 stack into the kernel like you know, they wanted to 10 years ago. We go, no, you write your driver for the soft there. And it, you know, you, you, you commonality as much as possible. So I, I believe that we need to try and get the same sort of level. We need to define what we believe to be the Linux compute stack and tell the vendors, this is what you should be at least aiming for as a baseline. Yeah, if you want to keep going with your private stacks and on your, you know, your well-tuned things and you want to share them with Windows, that's fine. They do that with graphics drivers now. They, they'll have an open source work that's actually in the distros and then they may have their own open source or closed source or vendor specific code that nobody has to care about unless they have some you know, business relationship with them. So I think it has to be standards based. I can't really say we just take CUDA and it re-implemented as an open source project because you can't control something that's led by a single vendor. Um, doing things that are controlled by Kronos, it's still not open source, but there's a lot more input from vendors and distributions, and you know, there's a lot more areas you can get control over how things are going out. Um, I believe the APIs need to be common. I don't think we should, you know, there should be a, the execution environment needs to be as common as possible. The IR needs to be common. We can't, the ELF objects can't go having NVIDIA code and MD code and Intel codes. You need one thing in the, in the ELF object, and the ELF object then should be portable across vendors. And we need tooling in the end that's common, because one area that I haven't really dug into here is, okay, well, you've, you run this, but how do you debug it? How do you profile it? Oh, there's a vendor tool for that. Well, I don't want to learn every vendor's tools. It's not like, I want to be able to use GDB. I want to be able to use Perf. You know, there's a, the range of tools that we Linux already has, and people are familiar with. You want to be able to use those tools. You don't want to be, oh, God, I've got to learn a whole new vendor stack every time you switch graphics card. It's like, that would just be draining. Um, so, like, my currently is like a bit of a proposed stack picture. I kind of feel Cycle is the only thing in the right place right now. I, uh, in, maybe in five years, C++ will be in the right place. But right now, I think Cycle is the only thing that's at least a standard implementation. There is a standard. There may be too much in the standard, but at least it exists and it's possible to do it. You plug it into an upstream CLang Cycle front end. So you write a common Cycle front end that's upstream in CLang, and all the vendors contribute to that. Your, and anyone else, yeah. So add uh, the LLVM device compiler, so the, the device compiler for the cycle code is upstream LLVM as well, so there's no forks, no crazy stuff. And it will spit out SpearV, and I mean OpenCL SpearV right now. Uh, Vulkan SpearV could be an option in the future, but right now it's not. Uh, you would then throw that into your ELF object file. You then have an ELF object file you want to get an execution environment. You want to have your cycle libraries. So you're going to have one area that's kind of, again, I'm hand-waving a lot in this area, is how to do vendor-specific library. I, I sort of feel you should still have, so for things like BLAST, where they've got linear algebra stuff, there must be, I'm going to guess there's at least 15 BLAST implementations existing in the moment. Why is there 15 BLAST implementations? And everyone targeting different things. It's like well, couldn't you just have one BLAST project with 15 implementations inside it that's not everyone forking it? Like, how do I distribute 15 BLAST implementations? I'm not going to, the overhead's just too much. People are only thinking of very small problems of like, how do I get something? It's like, how do I distribute this? How do I get other people into this area? Um, so that, and that's definitely an area that needs a lot more research, especially around things like the DNN library that TensorFlow uses from CUDA and the HIP one, because that, there are some really tuned implementations of things just to make TensorFlow that much faster on that GPU. And getting that stuff open source and having someone invest in that is possibly a, a, a very big uphill battle. But, you know, I've, I've done stupider things uphill, so we'll see what happens. Uh, the runtime, I would believe, would need to be based on Mesa at this point, using the open, Mesa's OpenCL. 
I don't really care to make the OpenCL and Mesa standards compliant as such. I don't want people to be using OpenCL other than to launch things that came out of cycle. I, you know, it's, I don't feel the need that we need to have the full C and C++ implementations in OpenCL. I actually would like it to be Vulkan. I think Vulkan is the right level of API for a launcher. It doesn't do anything that you don't want. It doesn't have a compiler. But I just don't think it's right yet. But I'm going to do some experimenting. Someone has actually started doing a cycle over Vulkan experiment already. So uh, we'll see. It might be useful. Vulkan also doesn't really have some of the more modern things you want, like virtual memory, shared virtual memory things, like Jerome was talking about yesterday in heterogeneous memory management. Vulkan's not really ready for that yet. Um, OpenCL's not. It, it has it in the standard, but I don't think anyone ever implemented it before about a few months ago. And it has some issues. But I want, at the end, to be able to run this on all three vendors' hardware. I want one binary that I build that can then run across the three hardware. So we'll have a, the Mesa runtime will be a finalizer. It will take the Spear VIR. I might just go this one. So actually a bit of details on the OpenCL. So the runtime would be, you'd minimize your GPU-specific code as much as possible, abstract the runtime API, which would be OpenCL, but it could be Vulkan. We'll use the existing graphics Gallium drivers to actually run the hardware, or Vulkan drivers if we get there. And there will be a Spear V, V to near to hardware finalizer of code. Like it's pretty much a compiler. They call it a finalizer, but they, they use that just to stop you confusing it with the other compiler. Um, currently, like in Mesa, the near backends, we have an Intel near backend, which is in Mesa. We have an AMD LLVM backend that we, the near backend plugs into. So, but we are actually, there's discussions on actually making, getting rid of that in some areas and just having an AMD near backend that we can control. And there's a Nouveau backend for near as well. So we have coverage of the three vendors. So the LLVM bit in there is kind of optional. Um, so yeah, that's, that's pretty much the picture. Like there's some problems in the A. Like, for instance, very specific sort of problem. We, and this is just for John. <laughs> so the NVIDIA hardware, we can't currently make the VRAM go fast. So you could build a compute stack but practically, you can't use a compute stack with open source drivers because the VRAM is being clocked at whatever it booted up at. And to actually make things run, you know, you, the whole point of putting stuff onto the GPU is to do it faster than the CPU. And if you can't make the VRAM run at full speed, you, so. Well, but those things are all in discussion on how we could move forward and open, get sort of, you know, drivers that let us do all that stuff. And that, that will actually open up a lot of possibility, I think, if we can get the Nouveau stack into a space where Oh, look, it can run, it can at least have the possibility of running code at the same speed. And then, it's, then it's a software problem. Then it's a compiler guys, we can, the community can actually move on it as opposed to we're stalling, we're stalling. And I, get, I think that's, you know, that sort of thing. And same, AMD is pretty good. The drivers should be able to execute everything. And same with Intel. Their drivers should be able to execute the things at, you know, at Intel speeds, which is not, not that fast, but, you know. <laughs> Well, yeah, that's my, any questions or conclusions? Thanks. Yeah. So you, you mentioned a few times uh, machine learning, like yeah. an interest for the workload, um, but the solution is for generic uh, compute. And it's, so it offers much more and it will be a lot of work. And I was wondering if you have considered targeting a much smaller API, like for example, I XLA, like TensorFlow is moving towards that instead of a eigen cycle in this case. So, so for, for example, you could uh, implement a XLA backend, which would be a Gallium state tracker, <clears throat> and then you would be using all the Gallium drivers like that, and it could be much less work. And maybe you get a better because XLA is much more closer to what uh, machine learning needs than a generic compute. Yeah, the well, uh, uh, question is more like what we've talked about doing a sort of a machine learning, a, a smaller surface API specific stack, I suppose. And it's, it's tempting, but I also get the feeling that there's a lot more out there that people want 
to run, even though TensorFlow is like, and I know we're starting again, I'm, and also the cycle stuff I haven't really mentioned, Xilinx are like big into it, it's a big FPGA area again. So there's a lot of research going on and what we could do with this API. API. I, I, yeah, I feel if, I, if we try to limit ourselves to one area that we could, that area could get grown out of pretty quick or it would change direction and you'd be left holding a bag of something that you, you have no other use for. So I, I'm trying to, you know, trying to keep it, Generic enough to be useful across industries because that's how you're going to get a bit more investment or get people involved, but not, you know, too, too, I don't want the, hey, I've got a great idea, throw it in there, and then nobody implements it. So it's, yeah, it's a balancing act, I suppose, to figure out where to. Yeah, I see that, but then I have a bit uh, concern because if you see the, the machine learning frameworks, the ones that have an OpenCL uh, backend, it's not in the main branch. So no, no, I'm not. It's that, always some fork. Yeah, the, the, the problem with the moment, well, having an OpenCL backend is pointless. It's the, the wrong solution. OpenCL is not the way to do machine learning on computing. Cycle backend is actually upstream, but doesn't work. So TensorFlow has a cycle backend in it. Eigen has a cycle backend in it. Um, there are, the, the problems with, with TensorFlow and Eigen and those projects with cycle isn't they don't, that they don't run on them is that you can't get code upstream to TensorFlow. Like I've had a C string include file, a patch that just includes three C string dot H's because they don't, the, the CUDA drivers are pulling those in and when you don't build a CUDA, they're not there. It's been sitting there for four months. It's like. Yeah, I have one as well. Six yeah. Months. How do you get, like, and then that's another question. How do we, like, we need to engage those people in terms of how do we get them to, benefits to them that mean that they're suddenly, they can get interested in. because. Those guys do want to run TensorFlow on more platforms. They're not, oh, we love CUDA that much. But we haven't given them the benefits to them yet. And you need to, we need to give them this thing that says, oh, look, you can suddenly do your you know, regression testing on other a machines and on other, you, know, you can branch out what you're doing. And I think we have to sell that to the TensorFlow and Eigen and those sort of communities more than we have to. <laughs> You know, hope that they're just going to accept what we do. I think it needs a bit more, a lot more interaction with those communities to try and. Well, yes, I guess we we could have both, right? Yeah. So I just want to make the observation that the you had a slide where you're talking about development and release being open source sort of separate things, and that's uh, I can summarize that in one sentence. That is, open source is a process, not a product, and I've been telling vendors that for about 15 years already. Yeah. Well, we, we have so a we have a statement in Red Hat that yeah, we actually we have a. It's a project, not a product statement. As a line, you, yeah, when you're sure. doing it, it's you know, we have you have to have an open source project, and then you have to have your product, and they can't be the same thing. Yeah, and you mentioned uh, you got me thinking about uh, performance monitoring when you mentioned Itanium and its compiler and how you had this magic compiler. Well, that depended a lot on performance monitoring to make that compiler work, and it, you had feedback loops in that to make it work, work efficiently. Do those f the there's two sort of questions I have about because I don't know much about GPUs. There's, one of them, uh, is there that same sort of feedback loop available for GPU and GPU performance in their tools? And the second one is, do you have to understand as much about a specific implementation of the hardware as you do for, I, as we did for Itanium and for Intel and for anything else that has a PMU? Yeah, I, I can, that's maybe another way I kind of have sort of hand, like, yeah, even if you get this stack, you are going to have to tune it per GPU. Yeah, this, yeah so I guess my question is, are those vendors going to release enough documentation for people to understand what the hell they're tuning? Yeah, the, the performance counters used to be this, oh, we can't tell you anything, and they're now getting to be performance counters, we'll tell you what they do, and then, you know, some of them are still a bit vague on what they do, but they are, yeah, they're, they're definitely coming around to realizing that you can't just have this one tool that hides all your performance counting stuff inside it, and then nobody needs anything else. That's, we, are, we are getting standards, like at least, OpenGL and Vulkan and those and OpenCL are starting to get performance counter standards. So I hope, the hope is that yes, the feedback loop will be possible. Right. One more done. So uh, OpenACC has uh, the OpenACC implementation in GCC has an NVIDIA backend currently, and uh, I think there's an AMD GCN back in the works as well. So how does that measure up as a stack compared to what you have? Because it, it basically has a standard API, which is uh, OpenACC, OpenMP, which is increasingly converging. And then you have like the entire stack, which is essentially open source in terms I, of workflow. I'm just, I'm just going to 
say that I haven't mentioned. I didn't mention GCC for a few reasons. Uh, a, it's LVM is not a great compiler for graphics cards. If you, and you can extrapolate from that how good I think GCC is going to be as a compiler for graphics cards, and it's not the good way. It's uh, it's not designed for this. LVM is already causing us problems that we're willing to drop it at the finalizer stage. Um, I, I don't think having GCC spit out GCN binaries or, P, or NVIDIA, non, even P, PTX I'm okay with, and even Spear V I'd be okay with, but spitting out actual GPU targeted oh, binaries. No. Right, right. So what, what it does currently is uh, it, it spits out NVPTX, and then NVPTX is fed into the CUDA libraries yeah. for NVIDIA. And for AMD, if I remember correctly, you, uh, it, it uses, I'm going to say, the LLVM assembler for now. And maybe you, you'll probably have the neutrals uh, generate that. Uh, but then what if, what if we could do something like uh, have the OpenACC, OpenMP kind of front end uh, generate OpenCL, Spear V? Yeah. For, for the compute parts, and then you have everything else. I think in this picture, if you if you were to take that CLANG cycle and LLVM device Simply. compiler bits and make GCC do that right. and spit out Spear V, I don't think that would be a, an insane solution either. Uh, I don't think it's going to get as much traction because LLVM is already a known quantity in that area. But yeah, I, I do feel anything that's not spitting out an IR that you can retarget at runtime is doing you a disfavor because you now have a binary you can only run on one GPU. And GPUs aren't like CPUs. You know, you don't want to be building your distro for x86 NVIDIA, x86 AMD, x86. You know, you don't want to suddenly have that combinatorial explosion of CPU vendor dash GPU vendor in your distro build system you know, or in your, your local containers. Even you know, it's just it gets unmanageable pretty quickly, especially if each one of those is a separate stack. You know, there goes you know so much millions of your time. So. Yeah, I, 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 I feel GCC is not a great answer for this solution, but I also know that people are looking into it, and it's possibly, a, you know, it may be a good, have a place in it as well. And then, again, you need the execution environment, and I think that's the area we need to you know, get a good execution environment, and then we can worry about, uh, you, know, you know, that's a, a secondary project. All right. All right. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Yeah.